Huh, another draft physics video, just a part two, I guess, to the last video, um, where I did solicit some sort of arguments, but, you know, I didn't mean them to be in the form of more rude crap, but, but anyway, that's sort of what you get. Um, so I'll deal with the two, there was two comments, I don't know where the other one went, but, uh, uh, well, I guess this is one of them. Um, so, yeah, so Herbie Guitar, I'll do that first. It's just such a stupid comment. You know, it's really not on the subject. Please explain your particle theory. Well, I have done that in hundreds of videos, and it's on the website. Please explain exactly what particles are. I don't have to do that. I've already defined what I'm able to describe based on the evidence. That they're corpuscles, little things, okay, of discrete... Uh, nature, where, where we, they have a, a definable properties. They have a weight, so to speak, and a ma momentum. Certain things we can understand. Where they came from, nobody rational has <laughs> a description of that. Nobody reasonable, because there's no evidence of origins. Certainly no evidence of a god, if that's what you're thinking. The assumption is that they are there. Again, this idea, no, it's not an assumption. It's based on the evidence of the fact that there's a difference between this space and this space. And we can quantify the differences. And if I put this in outer space, the difference becomes even more extreme. And we can quantify that. We can define it as a difference. We can see it, you fucking asshole. Uh, but what are they? what they are has nothing to do with physics. Physics is about explaining what can be understood from the evidence, what can be rationally observed and described. The evidence doesn't provide um, indication of origin. And why do they exist? So again, this question, why they exist? Why does the universe exist? There's no piece of evidence to use in any way to describe why or the first cause. It just doesn't exist. And it's totally, I would argue to you, even if you had that first cause information, like it just happens for stupid reason X. And so it's going to be stupid reason X. It's not going to be because it was a god who existed forever and invented it with his non-existent brain. That's not going to be the explanation. I can guarantee you, okay, <laughs> billion times, billion times the speed of light certainty that the explanation is not going to be some non-existent brain thought up the idea. Anyway, uh, they must have an origin. So again, it's just not a question physics can deal with. Physics can deal with what does it do, okay, and how does it do it, but it can't answer the question of why does it exist? There's just no way to get there from here. You can't understand that? The origin is buried at the bottom of the sea kind of thing. You can't get there. Retard. Fuck you. Anyway, <clears throat> all right, so Hoffa chimed in, of course. And, you know, it's not the rudest way of saying it, but it's just ruder than is necessary is the point. Um, of course, electric fields and magnetic fields are, as you say, in some sense... No, I'm not saying in some sense. I said pretty clearly that the elemental function is magnetic. The monopoles, the magnetic monopoles are the atomic elements. It's magnetic. Electric is a, is a byproduct of the magnetism. Electric isn't really a force. Electric is something we see because we see electrons move. That's electric. Electric isn't a force. The force makes the electrons move. I'm saying quite explicitly. They're not in some sense. No. One is definable as a force, and one is not. Okay, the same. Maxwell unified them, <laughs> in quotes, unified, in one particular sense. Yeah, well, he didn't really unify them. He just connected them. <laughs> okay? He didn't unify. Connecting and unifying are two different things. Unifying is saying they're both plants and they grow. You know, that kind of thing. Connecting a cow to a 
uh, a piece of grass isn't exactly the same thing. All right. But also they are unified under special relativity. Now I could just put that sentence in bold type and just say what shred of crazy fucktarded evidence do you have that there's any connection whatsoever between special relativity and the unification of anything. I mean the whole theory is basically taking force out of the game all entirely. Fields, everything goes because now it's some sort of bent thing and time is some kind of bent dimension. How the fuck does that in any way relate to this conversation? It can't possibly exist. Of all the, the videos I've ever seen, all the lectures in physics everywhere I've ever seen, I don't think there's been any moment where any element of special relativity was at all significant. In a sense, it was basically stated that, oh yes, well, there's a point zero 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 times 10 to the minus 18 effect caused by special relativity. It was never an element of the conversation of anything to do with electricity or magnetism. It's just a preposterous sense, a sentence. But also, they are unified under special relativity. It's just, I don't know how you could possibly think that. Uh, anyway, I mean, the theory is in complete contradiction. Anyway, the important thing to note, says you, is that they can be readily observed as different in some sense. Well, again, you say they can be readily observed as different. I'm saying, well, the difference is, is one exists as a force and one doesn't. One exists as electrons moving, and the other one exists as little bits, force bits moving. So, screw that. I don't think you've got given an account of that apparent difference. You say it's apparent, okay, that there's some apparent difference. I'm saying, <laughs> well, here, let me read that again. Um, readily observed as different in some sense. Accounting for what difference? Uh, you're not accounting for the fact that my statement is, is that electrons and protons are monopoles of magnetism. I clearly stated it. And the so where's the dis, the, this idea of a difference? One's a force, one's not a force. So yes, of course they're completely different. <laughs> you know, anyway, take a comb through uh, your mop of hair. So another useless insult from a bald guy. You know, petty bald comment, I guess. Your penis is showing, you know, the little tiny one. <laughs> you know, the only one you have. And watch it drag around some tissue paper or deflect water. So you could just ask the question. You could say, how do you account for? That's what I was sort of looking for. It's some sort of evidence that somehow this can't work somehow. But, again, it's not, it's not <laughs> you know, it's your will to misunderstand. It's not that I give you reason to think I said something that is in conflict with that fact. Because I didn't say anything about static charge. I mean, that really wasn't part of the video, so I didn't get into it. But I'll explain it. Um, anyway, stick a balloon to a wall. Well, I did mention that. The electric force affects everything. So again, he says it's a force. And again, I'll say, there is no such force. There's moving electrons. That's electricity. And they're moved by magnetism. All right. <laughs> uh, whereas the magnetic field only affects certain materials. Everything has protons and electrons in it. Therefore, everything is held together. Every atom is held together by magnetism. I said that in the video also. All right. So anyway, this art douchebag says, Hathaday, do you realize this nut thinks electrons are magnetic monopoles, right? Yeah, I said it in the video. I said it exactly. That's exactly the whole point of me making the video, was to point out that I don't think you have any evidence that they're not the magnetic monopoles. That there's no circumstance experimentally that can't be explained as electrons and protons being the monopoles of magnetism. So, I'll, I'll, I'll go to drawing and explain some of these facts. Um, you know, I don't know how many of the facts I need to go over, but I'll go over as many as I can think of that are relevant. Alright. Oh, camera's not great. But... 
focus is kind of sucky, but it'll have to do. All right. Um, okay, so <sighs> magnets are magnetic because the atoms in the magnet, okay, the entire atom in the magnet are um, in an orientation. So the magnet is magnetic because all the atoms are lining up with their protons and electrons in the arrangement of the magnet. So the red dots would be above the black dots. So all the atoms are lining up as the creating the effect of the magnet. And uh, black dots ahead of red dots on this side. I right, didn't do that very well, but it doesn't really matter. You get the idea. Uh, you'll get it if I have the picture <laughs> in view. So they're all fixed. There's no free electrons on a magnet. It's a conductor, usually. Um, it's it's conductive-ish as a, as a material. So it doesn't really like to have charge on it, as most conductors won't have charge on them unless they're forced to. Uh, because they kill the charge. They conduct it. If there's too many electrons someplace, they move them someplace else. So magnets aren't covered in free electrons. So, you know, there's no... Um, so, so I'll explain. Um, whereas, say, a uh, Vendegraaff, okay, a thing that creates a huge amount of voltage. So we're talking about a huge pressure. And we'll just say positive for the sake of... They can be positive or negatively charged. It just, it kind of just depends on which way they run the belt. Um, but it's a huge amount of electrons either exist, you know, here, or, you know, the opposite where they're thrown off at the base. So the base is grounded, and so this is where all the negative charge ends up going. And, of course, the ground eats it up, and this is where the positive charge is. So it separates the electrons from the proton. So it either pulls all the electrons out or it shoves all the electrons in. But either way, it creates a charge. And it's a really high voltage, you know, 100,000 volts. And so <clears throat> essentially a comb is a kind of vendograph in the sense that you can take plastic, an insulator, it'll hold a charge. And where does it hold it? It holds the charge okay comb really crappy looking one but it's there it holds the charge on the surface so unlike the magnet there's nothing happening inside the comb the comb isn't all the atoms aren't lining up and these are just free electrons so it has to be a, a substance that can um, hold free electrons so it can't be a conductor so you can't use a conductor and put charge on it and, and to do this experiment you you the conductor is going to end up going positive and negative, um, but it won't um, it won't hold the charge. You have to have two conductors next to each other if you want to maintain a charge. But anyway, so you couldn't do it with a. Uh, that's not entirely true. You can charge it if you insulate it. So if you insulate a conductor from ground, you can charge it. Um, but anyway. Um, Let's just get to the point of the comb. So, so the charge is all free charge. That is, all these electrons are weakly held. These extra electrons are, again, it can be negatively charged. It, you know, just depends on what you're doing, taking electrons off or putting electrons on. But the point is, is that the the object is, um, it's only a surface charge. So it's only on the surface. It's not coming from within. It's just on the surface. So, <clears throat> let's say in a piece of confetti is just another piece of paper. And let's say if it's positively charged relative to the comb, so the comb, let's say negative, so it has more electrons on it, then it will move towards it. Because the electrons on it are going to be attracted. And if the object is light enough, the electrons will basically just pull it towards the positive charge. And the process of that happening isn't by any, you know, standard rules. 
because these electrons are in a sense free to move through this field between the two objects. So in a sense, you know, when you have static charge pulling something together, what's really happening is the two surfaces, let's just understand them as surfaces, the two surfaces can essentially bulge to meet each other. So the piece of confetti that has too many electrons on it, the electrons will start moving, migrating into the field, into the space, into the atoms in the space, and likewise um, the positive charge will also bulge. And this is what's creating your opportunity for the charge to magnify. So as they get closer and closer, they keep bulging more and more. And then eventually when they get close enough, the electrons fly right across and we get a spark gap. So that's the nature of it. So what's understood is that this, when these things are bulging, that means their magnetism is increasing for that little space. So that could be a tiny space on a comb. So you could have a whole comb and that bulge could be on one little tooth of the comb. It could be right there. It could be another little place that has a little bulge. But that's really where the strong force is taking place and it's kind of a direct line to the, the negative, too much negative charge. And so the two things are essentially reaching out to each other and it's just like the spark gap. I mean, you can see a spark gap do exactly this. You're, there's a certain point where they get close enough and then the electrons can jump. But they clearly, you know, they even know this from lightning. You know, lightning creates a, you know, it's a, a path, uh, trail of ions are created first and then the lightning shoots through the ions. Well, the same thing is happening here. There's ions being created and the charge itself is bulging on the surface. It's finding the where the, the where the strongest negative to positive um, circumstance exists, and that's where the charge is going to migrate. That's where the more and more of them are going to go there. If they feel more negative force from this exact spot, then more of the protons are going to go there, more of the electrons. So they're going to meet each other. Um, <clears throat> So that explains the confetti thing. And, um, you know, it, when these, let's say a Vendigraph is producing all this, you know, electricity, it's shooting some through the atmosphere. That is, it's charging particles all around it. So it works so much better if it has the right atmosphere. Now, humidity will, you know, make it work less well because the electrons will get caught up in all the water molecules and it won't be able to charge them um, because they're kind of like conductors in a sense um, you know unless you can ionize them and it's probably not enough charge to ionize them all uh, but anyway um, so the point is, is some of this charge starts charging the field out here and that's why the so the magnetism in a sense migrates, the filtering process migrates into the area where something could be way out here and now it's going to be affected because the the magnet, the, 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 the field of magnetism, that is the filter, the filter is going to take the shape of the how the atmosphere will allow it, how much of the atmosphere it allowed to become part of the Vendigraph and so this essentially is the surface of the Vendigraph if there's enough of the right material in here, it's going to be able to extend itself quite far towards the the charged, the negatively charged particle that has too many electrons, and that so now it's going to be able to kind of pull it with this bulge of of magnetism that it's moving and migrating into the environment. Um, show that better. Alright, so what other example do I need to, to show? The water. So how they brought up the water one. So we'll do that. That's a lot more complicated though. Um, and you know, it has to do with the fact that the water's in motion, which is necessary for it to happen. Um, so the water is moving through a faucet and it comes down. And so it will pick up the charge of whatever the spout is and what happens is it creates ions 
um, positive or negative ions. So water can be ionized positive or negative. That is, it can lose electrons or, or gain electrons fairly easily. So when you move the comb um, with the charge on it near the water, what's happening is, is eventually the some of the charge, some of the electrons leave the comb and hit the water. The water has this motion plus the electrons motion and it creates ions. Those ions free electrons which go back to the comb actually and keep the charge on the comb and that process you know becomes a one of those eddy currents so to speak um, and essentially you're ionizing the water which in a sense is magnetizing it. You're giving it a positive or negative um, you know polarization and it's just you know you're pulling the water towards the opposite charge uh, and um, clearly there's some interaction uh, between I think the source so I think if you do this experiment too far away from the source of the water it won't work as well but I can't be sure of that so but I'm just saying water is a little complicated but it's just ions again and the ions are being created you know by this same effect that is especially near water you have a bunch of free little tiny water droplets so as this stream of water comes down I guess I should draw it that way there's a bunch of you know H2O molecules that are coming out over here and bouncing out over here and those are all becoming ions and so that's allowing little bulges of of magnetic potential in the sense of, of filter to filter out and so it's increasing the potential of the magnetism because essentially the field of the comb so you just sort of have to understand it is the the comb <clears throat> has a field strength around it and it's all on the surface and that that surface if there's molecules in the atmosphere that surface can change and be reshaped by incorporating the atmosphere as part of it. And so this is like the confetti argument in the sense that the confetti can do two things um, depending on what face is showing to the to the Vendograph. Um, you know, it can move away or it can move towards depending on what the, the charge balance is and it can actually just stick so you could have a vendograph that's really positive and the confetti will stick to it and essentially just become part of the vendograph in that it's stuck because in you know between the layers here's the vendograph layer and here's the confetti layer there's a plus minus relationship and the other side of the confetti goes plus now usually these are things that are kind of insulators so paper confetti isn't a great conductor so conductors aren't going to be affected by static charge as well as insulators are because essentially what happens with the insulator is is anything that hits it sticks to its surface so if a, a bunch of electrons come at it they're going to stick and it's going to become positively charged fairly easily and once it becomes positively charged and the Vendograph is positively charged, then it's going to be repelled. You know, unless it turns around, okay, and has a negative side over here. But, like I say, it can just as easily end up positive charged on both sides because it's an insulator. It doesn't, it doesn't balance the charges. So whatever charge it collects, it keeps. And whatever charge it loses, it loses. So there's another example. Let's say there's a piece of confetti coming down and it has extra electrons on its surface. The extra electrons, say if this in the venograph, let's say was um, yeah, say it was positive. What will happen is the electric the ex excess electrons will actually fly off the surface and leave the piece of confetti because they're not tightly bound and then the confetti will become positively charged because it lost its electrons to the Vendograph and so now it has a positive charge and now the two positive charges will repel and it will it'll fly away so it will go into the charge field seemingly neutral it will be charged by 
the fact that it loses its charge to the Vendigraph through the atmosphere, and then it'll become decidedly repulsive because it'll have the same charge as the Vendigraph. All right, um, so this really just has to do about potential. Again, this has to be a very high voltage, you know, for this, these kind of effects to happen. Static electricity is created by high voltages at very low currents. So it means there's a lot of electrons at the surface um, that are very uncomfortably compressed and don't like it at all. They hate it. They hate each other extremely. And they are quite willing to move into the space uh, quite freely. Um, to get away because they're they're really hostile to each other um, I'm, you know it's, it's just the basic nature of the the function okay so um, just for the rude asshole I'll say again this is sort of stuff we already know about the way atoms and magnetic domains work but the idea of their model is which I don't think is the accurate model but we'll just show it for the sake of it you have the you have the neutron in the uh, the proton in the neutron, of course, in the nucleus, and then you have this orbiting electron. The idea of magnetism, from their perspective, is kind of like <coughs> uh, planetary orbits in the sense that you could argue um, same distance. Yeah. So there's their magnetic moment is essentially saying it's an ellipse. So. You, you could you could you could understand it that way that the orbit is so out of shape. Well, I guess you should draw it this way, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. That the electron spends a lot more time out here than it spends down here, something like that. Um, like the halfway point is by volume would be way out here by volume and so that this is the nature of the imbalance so the magnetic moment would be the fact that there's a for every one second you know it spends 0.6 of the second there and 0.4 here that kind of difference and so that's essentially the origin of the imbalance uh, in terms of uh, the fact that there's more the, the electron is in this space you know more time than it is in this space so this space becomes positive this space becomes negative and so that's basic their basic theory I would argue that the electron isn't spinning around and all that kind of crap that they're in fixed locations um, held by the magnetic force between them the I've explained this before but essentially the, the nucleus is the positively charged and the electrons are in positions around them and they can't go into the proton because they can't overcome the repulsion between the electrons so you can't go this way because this repulsion between these magnets says no so you can arrange magnets if you're very careful you can arrange them in positions where they'll stay in those positions because the force will be exactly equal um, and there won't be any way for them to flip over. So if you can prevent magnets from flipping over, you could take magnets north side up, north, 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 and put one flat that was south side up, and you could set them up in this arrangement, like between two pieces of glass, and you could set up an arrangement where even though this magnet wants to crash into this one, and this one wants to crash in, and this one wants to crash in, and this one wants to crash in, these external forces between the magnets repelling each other prevents them from moving in this direction. And that's basically the tension that holds atoms together. So this guy thinks it's this is a nutter theory. <laughs> okay, that if there's no hope that this could be anywhere close to a correct answer. And I'm arguing they already have all the pieces in, in the sense of they already have an atomic theory that creates circumstances that are so obviously um, uh, similar to what you could create with magnets if you just use a few special circumstances, you know, where the magnets can't flip over and all, you know, the simple rules I've decided uh, created. Because we, we don't have any other way to synthesize it because we can't create monopoles. We can't create a lump of electrons and a lump of protons to use as demonstration models. Uh, but if we could, <laughs> this is, that's how they would work. 
they would work just like magnetic monopoles. Um, and, uh, yeah. All right, so is there anything else? I guess I'll go back and reread it to see if that covers enough of this stuff. Um, but the real key thing is the difference is, is that electricity creates charge on surfaces. Okay, so the thing is in here and the charge is on the surface. Magnets, the charge is in the magnet, so to speak. It's, there's no free electrons. They're not, they're not covered with a bunch of free magnetism. The magnetism is throughout the structure. And the same is true of a conductor. So when a conductor has electricity traveling through it, it's still a conductor. And what's happening is, is the pressure is being realized by creating surface electrons. And that's the, you know, the nature of the pressure is the fact that you're pushing the electrons. And by pushing them, it means that one, as you travel down the conductor, there's more electron pressure at one end. That is, there's too many electrons out on the surface here. And then there's too few on the other side. <coughs> and it's basically just creating a magnet. But it's a very superficial magnet because it's just on the surfaces. It doesn't go out throughout the whole conductor. But then with like things like copper, um, you can make them more magnetic um, by putting a magnet next to them and running it down their side and creating more magnetism inside the atomic structure. Getting the domains will line up, but they won't stay that way because they're too flexible and there's too much heat. So you have to get rid of all the heat to be able to create a permanent magnet out of a metal like copper. You have to, you know, freeze it to very cold temperatures for it to hold the magnetism. Alright, um, yeah, we'll just do a quick look to see if there's anything I necessarily have to go over. Um, I planned on, you know, waiting for him to make a few more videos to see what else he would say. Like I said, I, I wanted the, I wanted people to give me the reasons why it's not possible to explain every electrical phenomenon as a form of magnetism. And the whole point, the reason why the electrons are compressed, I mean, you know, just make this theory clear again. I, I mean, I've already been over this so many times. Uh, there's two forces in the universe, you know, polarized, electron force and proton force. Electrons <coughs> and protons react differently to the color of force that affects them. So if you have two electrons, the black force will always reflect. That is, so it gets stronger as the two electrons get closer. Same thing with two protons. The proton force will always reflect. But if a black force goes into an electron, it will reflect out perpendicularly. So, and likewise, if a red force goes into an electron, it will reflect out perpendicularly. <coughs> and so, um, well, it'll reflect out as red force, of course, of course, of course, of course. Um, anyway, um, and um, that's the, the nature of the relief valve. So if you have a proton and an electron, Two, two electrons, let's say, and then you have a proton between them. This is the point with the strong nuclear force, even though I drew it exactly backwards. You get the same idea. That uh, no black force can get trapped because it all leaks out. No red force can get trapped because it leaks out. And what you end up with is two electrons that wouldn't be able, in free space, they would have too much reflection between them and they would, they can't get any closer because the pressure would get higher and higher as the ping pong ball, so to speak, bounces back and forth. And <clears throat> so, but you can get them un unnaturally close to each other by putting a proton in between them because it gets rid of most of the force. There's low, very low pressure here. So the only pressure that can be maintained in between there is the occasional circumstance where red force goes into an electron perpendicularly leaves and hits the proton and then bounces back again and leaves. So it, there's always a, a minimum pressure that'll be felt from the field. 
but it gets rid of all the pressure except for that minimum pressure. And pressure is the whole reason why electrons move through a conductor. So again, it's the idea is you're, you have electrons in the conductor, and the idea is that you push magnetic force in, that's the black force, the electrons are moved by it, they move away from it, and by moving away from it, they create higher pressure. They can't, there's, there's other electrons in here that are saying get away, so they can't, it, they have to become compressed because they can't break through the atomic structure to go deeper, so the electrons themselves end up getting pushed into each other, and as they're pushed closer to each other, that creates more reflections, and that's what we call voltage. The higher pressure between the electrons is the higher voltage. And when you release that, then they relax back to their normal state. So alternating current is almost four currents. You're, first you compress the electrons, then you relax the electrons, then you pull the electrons back because you use positive force, which means the electrons have more liberty to go out into space. Then you push them back again. I mean, well, no, then you let them relax again because you take away that low pressure. And so it's, it's but you're just pushing the electrons. So it's a magnetic force between the electrons. The, the force between two electrons is magnetism. This force here is magnetism. And when this force is released as a photon, okay, that's what it is. It's really a piece of magnetism. It's a, it's a segregation at a frequency. It's the force between the electrons. And the electrons move much more freely than the protons. The protons are heavy and stuck in the middle of nucleuses in most cases. They don't have any liberty to go anywhere. So this whole conversation is really about the fact that atoms create a proton creates field energy all the way around it, just like a planet. It's all it's going, you know, like just like gravity. It's going in all these places. And the only places that are filled is where the electrons are. So there's still other spaces that are still attractive to electrons because they're further they're far enough away from these other electrons, and the electron can be weakly held here. And you can just hang out here in this weak bond. And these are the electrons we're talking about. They're getting pushed into the atoms. They're compressing this energy, creating pressure, higher pressure. And that's what's really happening, is these electrons, these semi-free ones, are moving towards the proton and then moving away from the proton, and moving towards and moving away. And they're held semi-weakly, so they can also be pushed from one location to another location, to another location. They're not fixed. <clears throat> but that's physics that's already in the standard model, in the sense that that's how they understand conductors to work, is the very fact that they have weakly bound electrons, an abundance of them, to be able to be pushed around. But these other electrons can't be. They're too strongly held. But the point is, is this proton force is in all these places. So there's the proton can hold more than the electrons it has in its orbitals. It just can't hold them strongly. All right. It's like this, you know. Well, I won't, I won't use the sun as an example, but whatever. All right. Well, I think that's probably enough for uh, uh, covering what I have to here. Let me just check. See if there's any other snarky isms. All right. Um, so again, uh, but they also are unified under special relativity. I'd love to see the explanation of that. That's in some sort of English form. I mean, there's absolutely nothing in special relativity. Space-time cannot, in any rational way, be connected to magnetism and electricity. That's just preposterous. The important thing to note is that they can be readily observed as different in some sense. Um, what I'm saying is there's not two fields, there's only one field of force. So there's only one force involved. It's the force created by a magnet, the filtering of the polarized field energy. You polarize it, it's magnetism. That's just a fact. And the only one of those two forces, you know, of the, of the magnet, the only ones of the poles that are relevant, 
to electricity are the ones that move electrons because the protons don't move very well. All right, take a comb through a mop, that mop of hair, and watch it drag around some tissue paper or deflect water from the tap. Okay, so I already did. Stick a balloon to the wall. So the balloon is the same thing I argued before. All you're doing is moving the charge to the balloon. So when the balloon is in the atmosphere near, say, a Vendigraph, it'll get positively charged just because it's getting hit, essentially, by the electrons. They're sticking to its surface, and now it has a, a, a charge. And if it's the other way around, all the electrons are pulled off. But regardless, it's going to have a charge relative. It's very, it would be a very unlikely <laughs> for you to put it near a Vendigraph and end up with the same charge as the wall. The wall is going to have the grounded, neutral kind of charge. So it's going to either have more electrons than the wall or less electrons than the wall. But it's not going to have the same number in proportion to protons, so it's going to stick. All right. Um, uh, balloon electric force. Okay, it's the electric force. You put that in capital letters. Again, it's not the electric force. It's either the proton force or the electron force, but those are the only forces. And the only difference between the proton force and the, electric, electri uh, the electron force is the fact that they inversely affect protons and electrons. They're the same elemental bits. They just have one distinction of their polarization. They're either electron polarized or proton polarized. All right. Whereas the magnetic field only affects certain materials. So his argument is is um, they affect everything. Well, they don't affect everything, the electrical force. Um, conductors neutralize the force unless two conductors are put next to each other. Then they have to go positive and negative. Just because the uh, the nature of the electrons on the surface uh, are going to repel each other. And whoever repels the fastest ends up becoming positive. And whoever repels the slowest ends up going negative. So it can start going positive and then it says, well, I'm way behind. This side is way more po negative than me, or positive. And the electrons will just shoot right back to that surface. So one of them goes and everything else has to follow. Chain reaction. Chain reactions are a part of physics. Uh, it's the same thing as happening with the ionized water. It's a chain reaction. All right, um, where the magnetic field only affects certain materials. So again, clearly <laughs> how the charge moves through different materials is a fact, how the electrons move. And that's really just deciding what the envelope of the magnetism looks like. The more the electrons move, the less envelope you're going to be able to maintain unless you put two conductors next to each other. Okay, so that's enough. Is there anything else I need to say? Um, I don't think so. I, I was just thinking about the, the, the why doesn't a magnet um, um, it simply does. <laughs> so, so magnets won't main, ma magnets can't bulge. Magnets can't change their magnetic profile to to uh, through induction. So when I was making the argument about the the fields bulging towards each other, that's why the magnet is such so weak in terms of the static charged object. It doesn't sense it as as magnetic because it can't conform to it. So so the magnet doesn't it, the, the magnetic charge can't is always consistent. It's always exactly the same amount of 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 red and black coming out. It never changes that the right way. And so <coughs> it it's not going to it's not going to create this move into the environment thing with electrons and stuff to to extend its its magnetic field because it doesn't have free electrons to do that and it it certainly um, uh, the magnetic side that's another question but I have to I'd have to think on that I mean obviously it's not electrons on the 
the proton side. But yes, the protons don't bulge here either because it's a rigid material. It's, nothing can move. <laughs> yeah, it's a simple answer, Gary. Just go with this. Yes, nothing moves here. The atoms don't move in the magnet. Um, so there can't be much induction between, say, a piece of confetti that got positively charged. But clearly the magnet's not also shooting electrons at it to create charge. So understand that part of why the confetti becomes charged is because it's actually getting hit with electrons that are sticking to it. So it's getting charged as soon as you put it in, say, the, the atmosphere of the high voltage. So as your finger, like if you're in a dry environment and you collect a bunch of charge off the carpeting and your finger has that charge on it, you know, the difference. So you have too many electrons, let's just say you picked up a whole bunch of extra electrons on your finger. Uh, a magnet's not going to do anything with that because that's a pressure of the electrons and the magnet doesn't have any electron pressure. Elect a magnet's not being created by voltage. See, there's no compression of the electrons. The electrons are perfectly happy where they are in the magnet. That's, how, that's the way I should have said it. The magnet, all the electrons are happy. They don't want to go anywhere. They have no interest in going anywhere. They just happen to be all pointed in the same direction. And they're perfectly happy to stay exactly where they are. So that's the big difference. Is that when your finger is going near the doorknob, your fingers moving charge into the atmosphere and the doorknobs moving its charge into the atmosphere and the two are meeting each other. The protons are bulging and the electrons are really bulging. <laughs> so that's the explanation. So anyway, um, I think that's enough. So till next time and such. I mean I don't you, people really just don't have to be snarky. These videos have all these explanations in them and all you seem to be able to do is be rude and obnoxious. Right? I mean, am, my original video, was it in some way rude? Oh, merely because I pointed out that I think it's kind of physics should have figured this out a long time ago. That these dots are pretty easy to connect. So that's being rude by saying, look, there's so many things these, all, these forces all have in common. Why are you using a different force for all these things when one force will explain it all? You know, with two polarizations. It's kind of obvious. I'm just saying the fact that there is no such thing as an electric force um, in the sense that there's no reason to invent, uh, there's no need for the creation of some extra force when if you understand the electron and proton do what the north side and the south side of magnets are doing you don't need the electric force but that deserve hey, that's too rude of me I can't I'm not allowed to say that people are such fucking hypocrites